Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back after your lunch. <laughs> we have the honor to, uh, to save you from your after lunch dip with a wonderful story, I think, about a real, uh, a real customer application of IoT. So I'm Rene Vogt. I'm with SensorTerra. And we are a partner of TTI. And with me on stage is Roman Kozak from Verdi Expeditions, one of our integration partners, using our sensors to build a precision irrigation system. And uh, we always like to start with the, um, the reason why we need systems like these. So Roman, can you please give us an insight in the challenges which we see in uh, agriculture? Sure. So we use Sensatera sensors to solve some key challenges in agriculture. And there are quite a few challenges. So in agriculture, farmers are faced with a need to use less water. And this is due to drought. Uh, this is also due to climate change and new sustainability certifications and requirements that require a grower to use more or less water every year. And these sustainability requirements also require growers to be aware of how much water they're using. And one of the best ways to use less water is to measure it. So that's where Sensatera um, and other soil moisture companies uh, come into the picture. Growers are also faced with in other increased costs like labor and fertilizer. And fertilizers are actually injected most of the time into the water supply. So when you use less water, you also use less fertilizers. And while having these challenges, growers do need to be continuing to find ways to increase their yields as well as improve their qualities to stay competitive and to uh, bring in revenue. So this brings about an incentive to micromanage for a grower. So the way that most farms are irrigated right now is they apply the exact same amount of water to the entire field, like a vineyard. One valve, you turn it on, and the entire vineyard gets the same amount of water. But what if you could break up that vineyard into multiple different irrigation zones and give each zone the optimal amount of water? Well, if you do this, it's called variable rate irrigation, and you see immediate savings. So 25% reduced water and fertilizer usage and 10% increased increases in uh, yield as well. And in order to do this, um, you need to know where those irrigation zones should be. You also need the infrastructure on your farm in order to irrigate to that precision. So the way that we do this at Verdi um, is through our customer dashboard, which is very specific and built specifically for farmers. And we take in multiple data sources, such as NDVI imagery from Planet Labs, soil moisture from Sensatera. And we help the grower figure out exactly where these irrigation zones should be. Most of the time, they are based on the soil type, which varies greatly across farms. So we measure the soil moisture in that zone. And then with our smart microvalves, we can deliver the water directly to those zones. So we retrofit to existing uh, irrigation infrastructure. And of course, these microvalves are LoRaWAN-based uh, IoT devices. So what we actually can say is that this use case is in the sweet spot of IoT. Yes, we, you can see there's so many devices uh, there on the field. And LoRaWAN, uh, because it's low cost, low power. Agriculture as well. Um, Farms are very large, and there's a lot of obstructions uh, due to the canopy. LoRaWAN is, is very optimal for a micromanaging use case like this. All right, and it might sound strange in a presentation from a device maker, but m maybe some of you have already seen it. It's not only about the sensor hardware. I mean, we all love the sensor hardware, but this is not what helps the farmer, right? What helps the farmer? Yeah. So what we found in agriculture is that Growers need a very customized, simple-to-use dashboard. Uh, growers um, and farmers, they are a little, uh, they're not used to technology. And in a lot of cases, they don't trust it. So we need to build a dashboard that's very specific to them that is exactly what they need. So this is our dashboard, the Verity dashboard. And as you can see, for this irrigation zone that the sensor is in, 
right there on the left, we are showing the soil moisture curve to the grower, but we're also helping them uh, determine when they should turn on and when they should turn off their water. And we get this data in part due to Sensa Terra um, through their API. Sensa Terra can let us know when the irrigation, where the irrigation point is for a specific soil, as well as where the saturation point is for a specific soil. So by having those two bounds and by having a control system on the farm, we can keep the soil moisture for that zone within those bounds. Yeah, so the data needs to be actionable. Um, that means that the data interpretation is key. Well, data interpretation in soil moisture is uh, achieved with calibration. Now, what is calibration? Um, every soil type has got different moisture um, behavior. A moisture behavior, I understand, at an IoT conference might not be you know, one of the regular topics. However, we put the device in the soil and we want to say something about the soil. So for that reason, what we do is we calibrate soil samples. We do this in our own lab. And as you see in this triangle, uh, more and more blue dots are occurring. So we are currently at the speed of around four to five new soil types every month. If the sensor is placed in a soil type for which we have a calibration, a standard calibration, we achieve an accuracy of 99%. But what uh, accuracy are we talking about? Well, for every soil, uh, we have a soil sheet with the characteristics, and these characteristics are different for every soil. So besides uh, calibration in a way of um, uh, making sure that we are uh, getting the good percentages in volumetric water content, uh, we also correlate those percentages with water tension. Another word which is maybe <laughs> a bit alien in an IoT conference, but it's actually very simple. Why? Because for every soil, we determine at which percentage it is too dry, at which percentage or in which bandwidth it's healthy, and when we are over-irrigating. Now, over-irrigation is maybe even a bigger problem than under-irrigation. If there is no water, you can't irrigate, okay? So you have to know when it's dry, when it's getting dry. But what often happens is that if there's enough water available, that people are just throwing too much water on the fields. For the farmer, in principle, that's no problem. Why? Because the water that's too much will wash out. But when it washes out, it takes fertilizer and other inputs down to lower layers, which are then polluted, but also the uh, fertilizer, which is washed out, is uh, wasted. And what we see is that farmers are easily over-irrigating by 50%. So, right. And the way I like to think about it is if you hold a sponge under a running tap of water, the point that you should shut off your water is right at the moment where the sponge is fully sat saturated. Because if you apply more water than um, is needed to saturate the sponge, you get runoff. And you can actually drain more water than was yes. originally there yes. in the sponge in the first place. That's a wonderful illustration. And what makes this topic even more difficult or more specific is that every soil type has got different ideal bandwidths. So there are other manufacturers of soil moisture sensors and they say calibration is not needed. Well, how do you then know in which soil type you are and how do you then know what the characteristics of the soil types are? That, that's not, uh, there's no soil moisture sensor that can detect the soil type. Maybe you can, with some machine learning and a lot of data, uh, you can you know, go into the direction, but it's just important to understand what's the solid fraction of every soil and then especially what are the specific uh, percentages and in our API we give uh, three things actually we give uh, the volum volumetric water content which is uh, a calibrated value we give a status which is dry uh, okay or wet uh, and we also give the thresholds to use in your own platform because that's what we ultimately want speaking of a platform and we are at an IOT conference so we couldn't um, uh, we couldn't leave this one out, right, <laughs> Roman? <laughs> so one of the reasons why we went with uh, Laura Wan, you know, rather than Cell or um, Satellite or another 
uh, low power, long range uh, system out there was because LoRaWAN allows us to focus on the challenges in agriculture. And the challenges in agriculture are building a, like I said, a dashboard that's very specific to the grower and their use case based on uh, extensive input from them as well. So as you can see, we have our dashboard on the left. It also allows us to focus on data science and ingest the right amount of the, the correct data um, sources like soil moisture, weather data, satellite imagery, as well as you can see uh, data up here from our nodes on the field as well. Um, so this, the, the, uh, the LoRaWAN network server and the gateway is completely taken care for us and we can focus on the data science, the dashboard, and only building devices that don't already exist. We would love to purchase an off-the-shelf microvalve that uh, can tell us when there's an issue with the water on the farm and control the water on the farm. But that didn't exist, and that's why we purchased it. But um, so yeah, those were, those were the main benefits of why we went with LoRaWAN, um, and it's allowed us to yeah, really focus on the important things. Um, and I think that that's one of the, one of the uh, success factors of this collaboration, that uh, Verdi can focus on their domain knowledge on helping the farmers. And this is something that we, as device maker, uh, want to see more, right? We want to work with partners, with domain knowledge, with decision support for specific use cases. Um, because these, we, we can basically, uh, I don't care if you put my uh, sensor uh, next to a, a, a vine or a, a grapevine or next to a tree or next to a potato, right? We make sense of water. Um, how do we do that? We have a range of single depth sensors and we have also a multi-depth sensor. So the single depth sensor is a very low total cost of ownership device, which basically measures soil moisture where you need it, in the root zone of the plant. Um, some people want to measure it everywhere, right? Well, fair enough. So that's why you can also use a multi-depth sensor. However, the multi-depth sensor can be very useful if you want to understand uh, soil profiles or if you want to understand how water is uh, uh, absorbed by the soil or if it's coming maybe from below. But you don't need that in every place, right? And I think that's the key uh, premise of, of uh, IoT, right? You just need a, a dev you use a device uh, for the specific task, and you combine them so that you will get the total picture. Now, one question we often get from folks who want to integrate our sensor is, hey, can we, um, can we uh, decode the payloads ourselves? Can we work with the payloads ourselves? Well, in principle, we would be super happy for you to do that, but then you get a uh, a value which is uh, consisting of uh, capacitance and resistance. Good luck with that. You will need to interpret it, okay? So it needs to be uh, translated into volumetric water content, and this is something which we do in our own calibration lab. So for that reason, I would like to show our uh, data flow. So if the uh, sensor data is picked up by a gateway, which can uh, either be uh, a, a, a community edition gateway, uh, a, a more or less public gateway, but it can also be with a, a TTI network. The only thing, if it's a private network, is that payload forwarding with a webhook needs to be set up. Why does it need to be set up? Because data needs to go from the LNS to our backend just to be calibrated, so to be translated and for the data to be added so you can make it actionable for your own end user application. So I think that that's a message which is super important. So yes, of course, we can give everything you want, but I think what we need uh, in the end user application is interpreted data, is data that says something. Uh, how is it then offered? Well, we have what we call an optional, um, an optional monitor where you can view your graphs and where you can do some settings uh, through the API. Uh, but ultimately what we would like, and which is uh, what has been set up with Verdi as well, is that you basically just get your sensor measurements 
which we have processed with HTTP push. What does it mean if your sensor sends an uplink, it's processed, and within minutes you have it in your own uh, backend processed. So this is all nice, data flows, architectures, etc. cetera, uh, but we do this with a reason. So uh, Roman, what are you achieving sure. with doing this? So by working with the world's largest food and beverage brands, uh, we are on track to save a lot of water this year. So 7 million liters of water um, from variable rate irrigation on the acreage that we're in in British Columbia, Canada, and California. And we're also looking to expand to other uh, farming regions. But you can see by knowing and measuring um, the water on your farm, and by specifically delivering that water only to the areas that need it in the right quantities, um, you can see a lot of benefits from uh, IoT solutions, LoRaWAN solutions. Exactly, because this is what it's all about. We like devices and architectures, etc., but we want to save water. Yes. And I think we're almost uh, on our last slide. But the thing I really wanted to um, talk about here was that agriculture is challenging. And I think you should really focus on the customer and how the customer is going to use your data. Um, so for us, we've learned that a dashboard is incredibly important. And of course, there are other dashboards out here that can compile information from various sensors. But in a lot of cases, that, that is not specific enough. Um, so we found that growers have a lot of requirements that need to be met. And that's why we've developed our own dashboard. Also, the agriculture environment is different for hardware as well. Direct UV sunlight, oftentimes 100% submersion in water. Um, tractors and harvesting equipment banging the devices around. So they need to be very robust and reliable. And one last thing is, if a device breaks in the middle of nowhere in a California farm, you're often driving four hours to go replace and service that device, and you've lost any money you could have possibly made on that device. So agriculture is, is uh, challenging, but we've learned a lot in the past uh, three years that we've been in business, and um, yeah. Let's see if we... All right. That was our story. Thank you very much for your attention. And do we have any questions? <laughs> Was it that clear? Oh, yes. For example, when you try to do the adjustment properly, you're going to have a, a wave. I mean, you reduce the water, and maybe you become too dry, and you open the water. How do you stop the, the wave the, the, for adjustment? Maybe it's good to repeat the question. I, I think I, I might have understood that, but yeah, I'll, I'll repeat the question. So we're measuring the soil moisture, and when it gets to the lower threshold, that's when we're turning on the water. And then we're turning off the water when it gets to the, the upper threshold. So how do we make sure it, it stays within those bounds? Well, what we have found in soil moisture, um, the response time is, is hours, typically. It's not minutes. So when you turn on the water, it's not, you know, it's not spiking right to the upper threshold. You're waiting you know, several hours at least to hit the upper threshold. So that's, you know, that's still reasonable in LoRaWAN uh, for response times. Um, and of course, we can increase device uplink frequency during irrigations as well. Yeah, feed forward instead of feedback. Um, one question. Yes. Yes. So the question is, can the sensors also be used in other use cases? And, and, and the suggestion uh, is made about dikes in the Netherlands. So we are here four or five meters below sea level, just that you know. 
these dikes are protecting us and the dikes uh, are often made of clay or they have an outer layer of clay. And we are actually currently doing a pilot with a water board where they have installed 30 sensors in arrays, in dikes, uh, in the clay layer. And what we are currently doing in our lab is we are monitoring the clay and drying it out and see when it's going to crack. And then we have uh, an indication when the dike needs to be inspected because in the last summer when we had four or five months of drought, dikes were cracking, but then people who were inspecting it, they didn't, know, didn't have a clue where to start. So yeah, this is absolutely a great use case. You are developing now this kind of knowledge? Abs yeah, and we are developing the knowledge. So we provide, let's say, the water board with accurate data on the clay uh, both the uh, volumetric water content values, so the percentages, and the interpretation. When is it too dry? When is it potentially going to crack? And this information is then built into their, uh, they have a, a, a whole, a very big information system, and it's built into their information system. Because uh, that's what we want, API first. It looks like we're at time, yes. I think. Um, but I'll be at Sensatera's booth for a few minutes after this if anyone has questions for me. All right, and we have a booth. <laughs>